Hello, I'm Paul Beckwith. I'm going to talk all about the Earth system and abrupt climate change in the past, present, and future. A bunch of us at uh, AMEG, which is led by John Neeson, have been thinking about these things for many, many years. We've been thinking about where we've been in the past, what's happening right now with abrupt climate change, and where we're heading to. So we've been working recently on a report um, and I'm going to talk about some of the details in that report in this video. So the concept of the Earth system arises from the recognition of the existence of a complex network, interconnecting network of interacting processes which maintains the global ecosystem. Buckminster Fuller was a great advocate for viewing this interconnected network of processes as a system. He included the moon as part of the Earth system, since there are important interactions which affect the timing of events like tides and, and things like that. A certain understanding of the Earth system and how it operates is essential for deciding on the best approach for climate restoration, to bring an unstable climate, which we're experiencing now, back to a stable climate. Climate restoration involves interventions to move the Earth system back from where it is heading at the moment towards a more favorable state for humanity and for the ecosystems and biodiversity that we all appreciate. Several major Earth system processes and their associated trends need to be halted and put into reverse. In particular, the rise in mean global temperature, the more rapid rise in Arctic temperatures, and the retreat of Arctic sea ice needs to be halted and put into reverse in order to get back to a healthy climate, a stable climate. We can judge the degree of urgency for intervention according to the behavior of these processes. In particular, the rate of acceleration of these processes, which involve significant amplifying feedbacks, known as positive feedbacks. You get a small change in one direction, and some feedback pushes it to a much larger change in the same direction. That's a positive feedback, or amplifying or reinforcing feedback. Is, there's nothing positive or negative in the normal sense of the word to it. Into this mix, we can add the human-caused greenhouse gas emissions, which have a heating action, of course, on the planet. Reducing these emissions obviously helps if your objective is to reduce the level of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. They've just surpassed 413 parts per million. For example, every gigaton, every billion tons of CO2 that we emit means that an extra gigaton of CO2 will have to be removed by carbon dioxide removal just to restore the CO2 level. We need to remove about a trillion tons of CO2 to get the CO2 level down to 300 parts per million by 2050. This is assuming that emissions from humanity declines over this period and that emissions from natural sources don't accelerate and get out of control. So we have a tough situation here. Significantly more CO2 would have to be removed if emissions stayed under their current level. Now the current, every year we put in about 37 gigatons of CO2 per year. So from now, 2019, call it 2020 to 2050, 30 years, multiply it by 30 by 3.7 gigatons per year, and you get over a trillion tons. You get 1.1 trillion tons. So if we came up with this way to remove 2 trillion tons of CO2 by 2050, we could get back to 300 parts per million, and our emissions could still be what they are yearly. But this is a very, very tall order. If we slash emissions to zero now, we'd still have to remove a, tr a trillion tons. Okay, so you can see the scale of these numbers are 
it's a very, very difficult thing to do. But, you know, nobody said it would be easy to restore a stable climate, restore a healthy climate. The Earth system has all of these natural climate control mechanisms that have been in play throughout the history of the Earth. From the time that we're very young, young uh, infants, we have been brought up to think of a beneficent, benevolent Mother Nature protecting us and our environment. But actually, in reality, our environment, by what I mean, our te the temperature, the climate, sea levels, etc., is controlled by an elaborate autonomous or automatic mechanism, which is the operative component of the Earth system. This remarkable mechanism or series of mechanisms has kept the climates, the planet's cl climate system suitable for the emergence of life and evolution over billions of years. The mechanism contains various cycles, including carbon cycles, nutrient cycles, and hydrological cycles. All of these cycles are relevant to the maintenance of Earth. The mechanism also includes geographically configured elements, which then set up the patterns of circulation of the oceans and the atmosphere, and the freezing and melting of snow in the cryosphere when there is a cryosphere. The geography of the continents has changed over time with continental drift, and the present feature of an ocean around the North Pole and a continent around the South Pole, Antarctica, is of crucial importance to the planet's overall climate. The Atlantic Meridional Overturning Circulation, AMOC, A -M -O -C, is also known as the Great Ocean Conveyor. It relies on Arctic sea ice for its propulsion and has had a key role in some abrupt climate changes in the past. Over the past 144 million years of the Cretaceous and Tertiary periods, life evolved as the level of carbon dioxide was reduced from about 2,000 parts per million to a few hundred parts per million. The great mountain ranges of the Andes and the Himalayas were thrust up during these continental drift processes and subsequently weathered down, which has the effect of natural CDR or carbon dioxide removal. So weathering is a long-term process that reduces CO2 in the atmosphere. Also, this uh, plant, Azola, in the Arctic Ocean is also thought to have mopped up vast quantities of CO2 in the past. More recently, over the past 3.588 million years of the Quaternary, also known as the Ice Ages, the mechanism has been driven by Milankovic cycles to provide a widely varying climate suitable for the evolution of Homo sapiens. The switching of the AMOC, or the Atlantic Meridional Overturning Circulation, between states has contributed to this variability in the climate. Large volcanic eruptions, such as Pinatuba in 1991, have injected sulfur dioxide, SO2, into the atmosphere, actually the upper atmosphere, the stratosphere, to cause occasional rapid cooling events, lasting up to several, several years of, of cooling of the planet. There have also been very rapid warming events that are thought to be associated with the Arctic switching from a state of perennial sea ice to a state without sea ice throughout the year. Temperature changes recorded in ice cores from the Greenland ice sheet suggest that at the end of the Younger Dryas period, 11.7 thousand years ago, Arctic temperatures rose by over 10 degrees Celsius over a few decades. The central Arctic Ocean became seasonally free of ice and remained so for several thousand years during the so-called thermal optimum at the peak of the Milankovic warm, warming cycle. Now, the Milankovic cycle that's to do with the amount of light reaches the Earth varies because of the orbit of the Earth, the tilt of the Earth, 
the precession of the rotation of axes and the ellipticity of the orbit of the Earth around the Sun. Perennial ice may have returned about 8.2 thousand years ago when the ice dam holding back Lake Agassiz, now Lake Agassiz was an enormous lake which encompassed, you know, which, which, which would have swallowed up the entire regions of the existing Great Lakes today and gone much beyond. So this massive, um, ice, massive lake was, the water was held back by an ice dam. When the ice broke, fresh water flooded via the Canadian rivers on, on, onto the surface of the Arctic Ocean. And this is thought to, uh, the, the, the cold injection into the Arctic and the fresh water being able to freeze at zero degrees Celsius as opposed to seawater temperature freezing at minus 1.8 Celsius with 3.5% salt, you know, sort of standard ocean numbers. Um, it allowed the sea ice to return. Subsequently, over the last few thousands of years of the Holocene, there has been anomalous stability of temperature, climate, and sea level, allowing for the development of human civilization, agriculture, trade and infrastructure, with gradual deforestation and urbanization. However, unfortunately, these stable conditions started to change during the last few centuries, after the Industrial Revolution, and mo more specifically over the last century, with the advent of the so-called Anthropocene, where mankind's, humankind's influence, women too, on the Earth system's mechanism has taken the planet away from the Holocene norms, especially as a result of a massive injection of CO2 and methane into the atmosphere. The most startling repercussion of, this, of the global warming produced by greenhouse gases has been the accelerated warming and melting of the Arctic. This acceleration is largely driven by a vicious cycle known as albedo positive feedback. As the sea ice retreats, the open water absorbs more sunshine, right? It's darker. This heats the salty saline layers beneath and it encourages further melt and retreat of the sea ice the following year. So there's a memory effect. The Arctic is now warming several times faster than at lower latitudes. Until a few years ago, scientists were not sure how the Milankovic cycles could have led to such a varying climate prior to the Holocene. But we can now appreciate that a rapidly warming Arctic reduces the temperature gradient between the Arctic and the tropics. This, this destabilizes the jet streams, causing them to meander more to the north and south. There's also less energy as in the jet stream meanders. So they tend to get stuck in blocking patterns more easily, and this results in stuck weather, persistent weather. This has led to a noticeable increase in the frequency, severity, and duration of extreme weather events over the past uh, number of decades. In particular, the intensity and length of floods and massive droughts, also wildfires. Now, abrupt climate change Mankind's activity is the source of an excess of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere over and above their pre-industrial levels, in particular of CO2 and methane, also nitrous oxide. This excess has led to a heat imbalance for the Earth's system. So the heat input into the Earth's system is rising faster than the heat output. This is, so the temperature has to rise. Okay, but will this cause abrupt climate change? So we, we have the following chain of events in the Earth system. There's an excess of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. There's extra heat input into the planet. So average temperatures rise. Now the land heats faster than the oceans because the oceans have a huge thermal heat capacity. So there's climate shifts um, in patterns with more severity of extreme weather events. So there's more intense monsoons, for example, as the damp, moist air is pulled from the oceans over to the heated, over to the, over the land masses that have heated much faster than the oceans. The extra humidity from the evaporation of the water 
the excess humidity in the air 